One of the most famous war machines to ever be invented was the tank, the origin of which can be traced back all the way to the Renaissance with Leonardo da Vinci's fighting vehicle designs. Side note, he also had designs for the helicopter, and even though Igor Sikorsky is credited with inventing it, he always gave the credit to da Vinci. Back to the tank. It first made its debut in September 1916 during the Great War in the Battle of the Somme at Fleur Corselet with mixed results, and as the war progressed, it went through modifications in terms of design and doctrine. The British Mark I of 1916 eventually became the Mark V by 1918 with a more powerful engine and better steering. The French first started out with the Schneider CA1, then the saint Chamond, before developing the Renault FT, which was faster, more maneuverable, with a fully rotating turret. The Germans even developed the A7V with a high road speed but with poor mobility compared to the British Mark IV. After the war and through the 20s and 30s, multiple countries developed their own versions of the tank. The British developed the Cruiser and Matilda tanks. The French developed the Samoa S35 and Renault R35 tanks, along with the heavy Char B1 with a 75mm howitzer on the hull. The Soviets, for their part, created machines such as the KV-1 and the T-34 that would become famous in the Second World War. Even smaller nations created their own tanks. Czechoslovakia built several models which were used by the Germans after they annexed their country. The Hungarians also created the 38M Toldy, which took inspiration from the Swedish Landsverk L60. And despite the Treaty of Versailles, Germany still developed their Panzer tanks. Then, as the Second World War broke out, tanks saw more and more action, and countries on all sides worked to develop newer models. The U.S. developed the M4 Sherman tank, which arrived in North Africa in 1942 to help Montgomery's 8th Army in the Second Battle of El Alamein. And while the British made newer tanks like the Churchill, Comet, and Cromwell, they still had a large amount of Sherman tanks in service by war's end. The Soviets continued to use the T-34 tank throughout the war with modifications, but they also developed the IS-2 tank. The Germans, for their part, created perhaps the most famous and most feared tank of World War II. The Tiger. Designs for the Tiger tank go back to January 1937 and it was only supposed to be around 30 tons. This was later scrapped, as were several other designs and prototypes. And during Falgelb, the German offensive against France and the Benelux countries, the Germans seemed to encounter tanks that were better than theirs. In the Battle of Hanat, German tank losses were high, with 163 Panzers being damaged or destroyed. And in the Battle of Jean Bleu, the Germans lost a third of their tanks. Plus, British Matilda tanks in the Allied counterattack in Arras were only stopped when the Germans brought in 88mm guns, the only effective weapon they had for them at the time. This showed the Germans that they needed a better armed and armored tank. So both Henschel and Ferdinand Porsche were asked to submit designs for a new heavy tank by May of 1941. The tank was to weigh at least 45 tons and be equipped with the 88mm gun. This need was only reinforced when Germany launched Operation Barbarossa the invasion of the Soviet Union. There, the Germans found it difficult to destroy the T-34 tank with its sloped armor and the heavier KV tanks. In Otto Karius' book, Tigers in the Mud, he wrote, The T-34 with its good armor, shape, and magnificent 76.2mm long-barreled cannon was universally feared and a threat to every German tank up until the end of the war. On the 20th of April 1942, out of Hitler's 53rd birthday, Henschel and Porsche presented their prototypes at the Wolf's Lair in Rustenburg. And while Porsche's design was innovative, it required large amounts of copper, easily caught fire, and didn't accomplish anything on the testing field. So Henschel's design was chosen simply because it worked, and it did everything on the testing field. This was a disappointment for Porsche, who was so confident his tank would be chosen that he had already built 100 chassis before the demonstration. The final version of the Tiger tank would have 100mm of armor on the front and on the turret, with 60 to 80mm of armor on the sides. And when it saw action in late 1942, the Soviets and their T-34 tanks were horrified when they saw their shells just bouncing off the armor of the Tiger. So if an enemy tank wanted to take out a Tiger, it would have to come in real close. Which was difficult to say the least because it was equipped with the 88mm gun, which was originally designed to shoot down aircraft. It could destroy an enemy tank at over a mile, so any lone tank trying to get into effective range was probably long destroyed by that point. And during the Battle of Kursk, 
there are reports of Tiger tanks knocking out large numbers of T-34 tanks single-handedly. In fact, Franz Staudiger and his crew alone took on 50 Soviet T-34 tanks, destroying 22 of them and damaging several more, causing the rest to retreat. And during that time, his tank received little damage, despite being hit no less than 67 times. And in Normandy at villers bocage Michael Wittmann and his Tiger tank alone destroyed 13 or 14 Allied tanks, along with 13 or 15 other transport vehicles, all in the span of just 15 minutes. There were even several instances of Tiger tanks shooting down aircraft. The Tiger also had a huge psychological effect even to this very day. Allied tankers absolutely dreaded facing this tank on the battlefield because it would almost mean certain death. It essentially became like the boogeyman, only real. And Allied tanks would do anything to avoid facing them. They would call in airstrikes, artillery, or just bypass them entirely if they could. Upon learning this information, the general thinking is, if Germany had such a powerful weapon, how did they lose the war? Well, the reason is quite clear when you look closer. The Tiger was just a terrible tank. Yes, it had good armor. Yes, it had a monstrous gun that could take out any Allied or Soviet tank. Yes, it struck fear into many of their enemies, but it was an operational failure in many ways. First, it cost a lot of money to make a Tiger tank, and in today's value, it would be well over a million dollars for each one. Second, it took a long time and a lot of material to make and required a lot of technical know-how and had to be done in 9 stages. Initially, only 25 Tiger tanks were made a month, with production peaking in April 1944 with 104. But this pales in comparison to the 45 Sherman tanks being made a day in America, that's over 1300 a month. The T-34 was also produced in similar numbers, and this doesn't account for all the other tanks the Allies built. So the Tiger tanks are vastly outnumbered with less than 2,000 Tiger 1 and 2 tanks being built the whole war. And while the Tiger's armor made it incredibly tough, it also added a big weakness. It made the tank very heavy. A Tiger tank weighed between 50 to 60 tons. This made it too heavy for a lot of bridges, especially the smaller ones which could only handle around 30 tons. The Tiger 2 or Koenigstiger was even heavier at 70 tons. So if they couldn't get to a strong enough bridge, they couldn't cross any deep rivers until engineers came in. In addition, on the Eastern Front, there was the infamous Rasputitsa, where the melting snow and heavy rains turned the ground into a quagmire. In fact, when a platoon of Tiger tanks were deployed near Leningrad in September of 1942, their movements were confined to roads and tracks due to the swampy and forested terrain, which made defending against them easier. And when winter arrived, it was vulnerable to immobilization when ice and snow got into the road wheels, jamming them solid. Between the mud and snow, Russia gave us ice. And in the ice, my god, that Tiger was a heavy lump of iron to drive. That's not including all the mechanical problems it had. The Maybach HL-230 was a good engine, but was designed for a tank weighing around 30 tons, not one weighing over 50 tons. And when the first Tigers went into action, they suffered breakdowns just getting to the front. Of those four Tigers that I mentioned earlier, two got bogged down by the mud, and a third suffered engine failure, and they had to be recovered with half-tracks. The spare parts also then had to be flown in from Germany. Later on, one was even captured by the Soviets almost fully intact, allowing them to study it and develop countermeasures. In fact, many Tiger tanks were destroyed by their own crews after they broke down or got stuck. The Tiger II, Koenigstiger, was even worse, weighing 70 tons with even more mechanical problems. That's not even going into fuel consumption. For every mile a Tiger tank drove, it would use 2.5 gallons of gas. That's almost 9.5 liters. Gas which Germany could not largely produce domestically. Meanwhile, a Sherman tank would use just one gallon of gas for every mile it drove. During the Battle of the Bulge, the main goal for the Germans was to reach Antwerp, but the plan called for them to capture Allied fuel because they simply didn't have enough themselves to reach it. The Tiger was also slow. It could reach over 45 kilometers, 28 miles, an hour on roads, but could only go half that cross-country. But, in consideration of the equipment, however, we only drove 20 to 25 kilometers on the roads, and correspondingly slower cross-country. And speed was a crucial element in the German war doctrine of Bewegenskrieg. So if it can't go fast, then it can't be used effectively in offensive actions. The Tiger was also incredibly high maintenance. Just like it was incredibly complicated to build, it was also incredibly complicated to fix if it sustained damage or any parts needed to be replaced. The crew could handle minor problems, but for the bigger ones, it had to be taken to a repair depot. And if the engine needed to be fixed, the whole thing would need to be taken out of the tank. The tank also had 16 road wheels on each side, including inner ones, and if one of the inner ones needed to be replaced, 
The outer ones had to be removed first. The engine also needed to be kept cool and a water radiator with a 120 liter capacity and four fans took care of cooling the engine. The cooling rails on the rear deck, absolutely necessary so warm air could be extracted, were often the reason that tanks became disabled by otherwise harmless rounds or shrapnel. They damaged the radiators that were underneath. Even without all these complications, the Tigers were not invincible. The first Tiger knocked out by an Allied gun was reported as early as January 1943 in North Africa, when British anti-tank gunners with their six-pounder guns ambushed a group of panzers, knocking out the two leading Tigers. And during a German attack in northern Tunisia, seven Tiger tanks were immobilized just by mines. Allied tankers like U.S. Army Corporal Wilbur Jackson Myers said they would aim for the tracks of the Tiger, then go around and take it out from the rear. Britain also developed the 17-pounder gun, which could penetrate the armor of a Tiger. These were even mounted on the Firefly variant of the Sherman tanks, and even the M10 tank destroyers. The Russians also had plenty of tanks to spare, and during the Battle of Kursk, Soviet tankers rammed their machines into German Tigers. In short, the Tiger is not all it's cracked up to be. It was big, strong, tough, and had a powerful gun, but it was also a mechanically unreliable, high-maintenance, gas-guzzling, underpowered machine. They were too few in number, and with Germany fighting on more and more fronts, they couldn't be concentrated at one point. As stated before, things like mines and artillery would take them out if they didn't break down on the way to the battlefield. It was originally supposed to be an offensive tank, yet it had greater success on defense, like Franz Staudiger's tank at Kursk. It was a powerful weapon tactically, but operationally, and even strategically, was massively flawed, at least for Germany, which didn't have the resources to spare. And to quote one of my favorite characters growing up, without strategy, power is just an empty threat. Thank you for watching, like, comment, and hit subscribe.